I've ministered in her church back in Trinidad many times, and a good friend of ours, amen, there's a powerful ministry in Trinidad, amen, that God is doing great things, amen. I want you to know God is doing great things upon the face of the earth, are you hearing me? I want you to know, I say God is doing great things, regardless of all the situation, amen. You see, when there are problems, amen, and there are predicaments, amen, I want you to know, amen, you got to get confident because God says that anytime there is problem, he's a present help. In the time of trouble. How many are experiencing trouble this morning? Don't be bashful. Don't be afraid. Amen. Some of you have some needs this morning. Amen. Don't be afraid to put up your hand this morning. Amen. If the President of the United States was here and says, Anybody have a problem? I'm willing to fix it right now for you. If it's a monetary problem, you know, lift your hands. I will I'll have the people sign the check and give you. How many have problems? I would love. Amen. Now I'm seeing hands going up, you know. You understand? But I'm God who is the creator of everything this morning is here to meet your every need. You know, Pastor Judy is also the wife of a um, government minister of Trinidad and Tobago, Dr. Fazel Kareem. Amen. And we thank God for his input in the government. Amen. To make in Trinidad and Tobago a better place for all the citizens and all the people of Trinidad and Tobago. And we thank God for him and all his work that he's doing tirelessly. And you know, with government officials, they, I think they're just as busy as pastors. Amen. Yeah, he's probably, probably much more busy, you know, but we thank God for him and we thank God you know, for his family. Um, without further ado, I want you to stand this morning as I present to you um, Pastor Judy Kareem, all the way to Trinidad, Greater Love Ministry. Let's welcome her this morning to the platform. Amen. She's going to bring the word of life to us this morning. Would somebody say praise the Lord this morning? That was a weak praise the Lord. <laughs> Come on, you're doing it for the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, the one who alone is worthy to be praised. Can we say praise the Lord this morning? Praise the Lord. Say so somebody shout, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. As Pastor Dave said, praise looks good on you. Amen. It's such a blessing and a privilege to be with you again this morning. It's not my first time at Kingdom Life Ministries. And it's always a pleasure and a blessing and an honor to be here with you and even to minister the word of God. I want to thank your senior pastor, Pastor Dave, such a good friend and such a powerful man of God, so committed, devoted, and being used by God in such a tremendous way. His wonderful wife, Pastor Angie. I don't know if they call you Pastor Angie. I'm calling you Pastor Angie because there's no one else who carries the vision of this ministry like her husband as she would. Amen. Such a great source of strength and support. And I want to thank God for both of you and for the way God is using you in this part of the vineyard. But I want you to know something. The work that Kingdom Life is doing has only just begun. God has great things in store especially in the time in which we live. Amen. This is a season when the church needs to be very, very much awake, alert, and busy. Tell the person next to you, I haven't seen you looking too busy. Get busy. Jesus is coming. And you may have your seats. Hallelujah. I bring greetings from our ministry, the Greater Love Christian Center. In Trinidad, our main church is on the Mac Bean Stretch. So those of you who are from Trinidad, you may know exactly where that is, the Mac Bean Stretch. And last year, we launched another church in the Aruka area, and God is doing awesome things. Amen. Today, I want to share with you from the Word of God, from the book of Mark, the gospel according to St. Mark. Can we give the worship team a, a wonderful round of applause for doing such a tremendous job this morning? You know, praise and worship, it's an act of warfare. As Pastor Dave was sharing just now, when you get into praise and worship, you confuse your enemies. You have enemies. One thing, one sure weapon you can use against them is begin to praise the Lord. 
Stop focusing on who they are and what they're doing and why they said and who is to blame and all these things that we tend to get caught up in. And just get your eyes upon Jesus. Amen. Remember, he has conquered death, hell, and the grave. And he's alive forever evermore. He is the conquering lion of the tribe of Judah. Amen. And because he rose from the dead, the Bible says we are more than conquerors. So we need to look like it and we need to behave like it. And more than a conqueror, in the midst of a fiery trial, will lift up a song of praise. That's how you know you are more than a conqueror. Amen. Praise God. So we are looking at the gospel according to St. Mark chapter 5. Reading from verse 25. Now, this is an account that we, you all would have heard preached so many times. But I believe that there's a word for us this morning. There's something that God will speak to our hearts about this morning. Reading from verse 25. And it says, And a woman who had an issue of blood 12 years, and had suffered many things of many physicians, and had spent all that she had, and was nothing bettered, but rather grew worse, having heard the things concerning Jesus, came in the crowd behind and touched his garment. For she said, If I touch but his garments, I shall be made whole. And straight away the fountain of her blood was dried up, and she felt in her body that she was healed of her plague. And straightway Jesus, perceiving in himself that the power proceeding from him had gone forth, turned him about in the crowd and said, who touched my garments? And his disciples said to him, Thou seest the multitude throng in thee, and sayest thou, Who touched me? And he looked around about to see her that had done this thing. But the woman, fearing and trembling, knowing what had been done in her, came and fell down before him, and told him all the truth. And he said unto her, Daughter, thy faith hath made thee whole. Go in peace, and be whole of thy plague. Let us bow our hearts in prayer. Heavenly Father, we give you praise, we give you glory this morning. For truly you are the awesome, mighty God of heaven, the one who rules and reigns, the one who sits upon the throne, the God who is in control, the sovereign God of the universe. We come to you, O God, with hearts of worship and praise and thanksgiving. We lift up and we exalt the name that is exalted above every other name. The name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. For at that name, every knee shall bow in heaven and earth and things below. Every problem, every situation, every circumstance, every wicked plot and plan and strategy of the enemy must bow and submit at the name of Jesus. And every tongue must confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Today we thank you for this time in your presence, for the sweet anointing of your Holy Spirit. For your presence that will surely break every yoke and every bondage and liberate every captive, open every prison door. Let your word as it goes forth minister to every heart and life. For your word says that your word that you have sent will not return unto you void, but will accomplish what you please and prosper in the things where to you have sent them. We thank you, God, that you will confirm your word with signs, wonders, and miracles. In Jesus' name we pray. And we ascribe unto you alone all the glory and the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. The scripture reading taken from the gospel according to St. Mark tells us that one day Jesus was passing by. And as usual, he was surrounded with a crowd, a multitude. There were many people around him, but the Bible says there was a certain woman. Now that woman could be any one of us here today. You are a certain person that has come into the presence of the Lord for a reason. And this certain woman, the Bible says, had a problem. I want to ask you, how many of you have a problem or a need in your life today? Something that you need someone to fix. Something that you don't have the strength to deal with on your own. I want to tell you, you are in the right place. This certain woman had a problem, an issue of blood. Now, her issue was a physical problem. 
but your issue might be something different. We all have issues. You know, I wish it was so easy that the day we got saved, everything became perfect, but not so. The day you commit your life to the Lord and the day you make a decision to walk closer with God, you become a target for the enemy. There is an enemy who comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. But there is someone who said that he has come, that we might have life, and life more abundantly. And the abundant life does not speak about a length of time. It talks about a quality of life. A quality of life in which we experience peace that passes all understanding. Joy unspeakable and full of glory. We have faith to move mountains. Amen. And therefore, even when we see the strategies of the enemy, no matter how bad he may sound and how big he may be, we always know that the greater one lives in us. He knows the end from the beginning. Amen. And he has not planned any defeats for you. Not one single defeat. Amen. Come on, help me preach. Amen. So this woman had an issue of blood. We all have issues. It could be a family problem. It could be a financial crisis. A sickness in our body. A problem on the job. Something that is affecting our ability to enjoy our lives. This woman's issue was there for 12 years. Imagine carrying around that problem for 12 years. I don't know how long you have been dealing with your issue. But you know what? Something happened one day that changed her life. And one of the things I have learned about God, which causes me to praise him a little more and love him a little more, is that what problem you may have carried for 20 years, God could fix it in, this, in a split second. And that's why... As our worship leader was saying this morning, when you come into the presence of the Lord, you are coming to one who is greater than a president or a prime minister. Amen. You are coming to the one who has the ability to turn around every situation in your life. And that's why when you come, you look to him by faith. Now, this certain woman carried her problem. Now, I believe that was a problem by herself. The problem stayed too long. Twelve years. Tell the person next to you, your problem has been with you for too long. Today is the day to fix it. Tell the person next to you, say, today is fixing day. Now, if something is broken, you don't just lift it up and carry it about with you. What do you do? If one of your appliances break down, do you lift it up and walk around and say, oh my goodness, my, my washing machine is broken? No. You call the repair person and you fix it. One of the problems we have as believers, we behave like believers, not sons. And when things happen, instead of fixing it, we groan, we grumble, we moan, we do the blame thing. Who is to blame? And then we go through the self-pity thing. Why should this happen to me? I never did anything. I didn't do anybody anything. You know, and Lord, I, I'm going to church every Sunday. Let me tell you, going to church every Sunday doesn't mean everything is going to be perfect. If you're going to church every Sunday, you're supposed to be learning something that tells you when the problem shows up, you, you, you deal with it right away by faith. Amen. She carried her problem for 12 years. And you know what? She did everything that she could. She went to the doctors. And I'm sure when the doctors couldn't help, she went to the, to the witch doctors. She went to the herbalists. She went to everybody who could offer her a hope. But nothing helped. In fact, the Bible says... She did not became, become better, but instead she grew worse. And you know something? When a problem is not dealt with while it is small, it festers and becomes a crisis that seems almost unable to fix. That's why 
My sister will tell you, from the time something shows up, I like to deal with it. I like to take the bull by the horns. I don't have time to be carrying around problems day in and day out. And when I cannot fix it, I, I go before my father and I say, Lord, I've done all that I could. You fix it now. You take control and I leave it there. Amen. Amen. The Bible says, they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. Now, the word wait doesn't only mean well, you've prayed and you're expecting something. The word wait also means to serve. You know, somebody who serves table, what do you call them? A waiter. A server is somebody who waits on tables. Isn't that, isn't that what they do? So therefore, while we are waiting to see our miracle, we have to continue serving. It's such a strange thing to see children of God praying about situations and sit down and eating the bread of sorrows and crying every day. Nobody knows the trouble I see. Yes, God knows. And he holds the solution in his hands. The Bible says he's touched with the feelings of your infirmities. Nobody else knows what you feel the way he knows. Why? He went through it all. Jesus suffered every imaginable thing. He was a man of grief, acquainted with sorrows. He has borne our griefs. He was wounded. He was bruised. He was rejected and despised by men. He was betrayed. He went through it all. And that's why he can identify with us in our suffering. But we don't just want him to identify with us, but he wants, we want him to move. We want him to change something. But that part comes when we stop feeling sorry and we stop blaming everybody else. When we stop looking to the bigness of the problem and we hold on to something that will move the hand of God. Now this woman, the Bible says, she had an issue of blood for 12 years. I want you to know the body of Christ also has an issue. Now, this issue that she had was a hemorrhaging issue. Blood was draining out of her. And you know, the scripture tells us in the blood is the life. That's why when we see blood being shed, we feel like, you know, we need to stop it. It's not supposed to happen because something will die. This problem that she had was draining the life out of her. And the body of Christ also has an, a hemorrhaging issue. In that because we have not been doing what God requires of us, the very life of Christ seems to have been draining out of the church. And that's why while the church is appearing to be weak and asleep, Satan is winning all kinds of victories. When the Supreme Court made that ruling, was it last week or the week before, it told us this happened while the church was sleeping. Should not have happened. Amen. And we are so caught up with things and programs and things that have nothing to do with the kingdom of God and proclaiming the good news of the gospel, winning the loss, pulling down strongholds, declaring war on an enemy that has already been defeated, the thief came in unawares. But you know, in God's scheme of things, all things work together for good. Because I believe this is a clarion call and a wake-up call for the body of Christ. And for all of us as believers who might think that all we have done when we got saved, all that we got saved to do was to go to heaven and be blessed. No, no, no. If that was the case, the moment you accepted Jesus Christ, you would have been raptured. Amen. Amen. But you are alive on this earth for a purpose. You have purpose inside of you. You have destiny inside of you. You have gifts and abilities inside of you that are to be used for the kingdom of God, to bring glory to the name of Jesus and to win a world that is lost and dying. I want to ask you, if Jesus were to burst the clouds this morning or this afternoon and you were to be raptured, what would become of your unsaved loved ones? What would become of the people on your job that we never took time out to tell them about Jesus? They would go to a godless, a Christless eternity. And I've been preaching to our church on Ezekiel chapter 33, which is the watchman chapter. 
It's a chapter many people don't like to read and they don't like to hear. But you know what? When you got saved, you became a watchman. You became accountable for every person in the sphere of your influence. Whether it's your neighbors, the ones who are treating you bad, the ones who are treating you good, your family, your friends, every person within your sphere of influence. God saved you where you are for a purpose. And I know everything in your life may not be perfect. In whose life is everything perfect? But we continue to press forward and to do what has been required of us. Amen. There's someone waiting on the other side of your obedience. There's some life that is waiting on the other side of your witnessing and your prayer and your ministry. So the church, the body of Christ, also has some issues. That's why God, when he spoke to the prophet, he said, If my people, he said, you see, there was a problem in the land. Destruction was about to come. And he said, I will fix it not because the unbelievers will suddenly get an epiphany and, and become different. No, he said, if my people who are called by my name, not another people, my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray. Are you praying? Are you praying? You know, nothing happens unless we pray. God moves when we pray. Amen? Amen. Your battles are won when you pray. Amen. So if you are not praying, you're not seeing anything. In the book of James, the apostle said, you don't have because you don't ask. That's why if you want to see souls saved, don't feel that it has to take some super evangelist to come uh, to New York or to any other part of the world and suddenly thousands will get saved. No. Every day you can minister to one soul. Amen. Amen. We have a responsibility. We need to deal with that hemorrhaging issue. Instead of allowing the life to flow out of the church, we need to get that life flowing back in. Amen. Now this woman, the Bible says, when she heard about Jesus. I'll tell you something about her problem. Her problem wasn't only physical. It would have been mental and emotional. Imagine having been told, we can do no more for you, you're going home to die. She had no more money. She was like a social outcast because she had an issue of blood. She couldn't be around her male friends and family or the people in the church who, who were males. She was considered unclean. She had an issue in that women in those days were considered second class. That by itself. Because they blame the woman for being responsible for the fall. So she had many issues. And maybe, you know, you have an issue this morning because somebody has made you feel very bad about yourself. Maybe you have felt rejected. Maybe a broken relationship and you couldn't understand how could this have happened. I didn't do anything wrong. You have been betrayed. So many things could happen because of that one issue that stayed around too long. But the Bible says, when she heard about Jesus. Now, it tells us she was willing to listen to something. Although men had given up on her. When men had said, nothing could help you. Nothing could change what you're going through. There was something inside of her that still had a little bit of hope. There was still that little bit of that, that thing that was crying out to live. That thing that was saying, I refuse to die. And when your problems come, and that's the attitude you must have, you need to say, listen, devil, I refuse to be defeated by this. You don't know who you're dealing with. You need, and you know, she said she heard about Jesus. That's a good time to hear something good. Instead of listening only to the negative reports, you know, it's not going to happen. You're going to fail. You know, you know, it's not going to work out. You might as well give up. You need to hear something good. You need to hear about someone who could help you. She heard about the right person, and that is Jesus. And you know what? When you have a problem, you need to want to hear the right thing. You know, sometimes we don't want to hear certain things. Many of the problems we find ourselves in is because of something we didn't do right. 
or some decision that we made that was not the right decision, and we know we should not have made that decision. But we have to learn to humble ourselves and take responsibility for our actions. When Jesus passed by in Jericho, I think it was, and there was a man who was blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, he said, Master, who did sin? This man or his parents that he should be born blind? And Jesus gave a response that was very enlightening. He gave a revelation. How many of you know a revelation must come before a miracle? There's something you must know before your miracle comes. Why? The Bible says, you shall know the truth. And the truth that you know will make you free. So there's something you need to know about your situation. Something you must be willing to accept and believe and put into action. So he said to his disciples, he said, nobody sinned. Now, they said, did this man sin? It tells us many times we have problems because we did wrong. Always remember, sin gives entrance to the enemy. Sin separates between us and God. That's why we don't give room to sin. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. De sin carries a penalty. Never feel that because you did a wrong thing and you didn't drop dead immediately that it's okay. Or that God thinks it's okay. No, it's not okay. When God says something is wrong, it's wrong. And the, the commandments and the instructions and the precepts that he has given to us for living is not to steal our joy. It's for our own good. He understands. He knows everything about the situation. And he knows that from the moment you make a decision to disobey God, you give entrance to the enemy who will steal, kill, and destroy. So many of the things we have found ourselves in may have come about because we did not make the right choice or we disobeyed God. So therefore, we need to repent. Even if you don't like anybody telling you that, you know, pastor, I could, I mean, we are pastors, so we know sometimes you have to counsel with people and they don't want to accept their wrong. They become very angry, but you know what? You'll stay in your problem until you humble yourself and go before God and acknowledge and take responsibility for your actions. And say, Lord, I did wrong. Like the psalmist David. Against thee, thee only have I sinned. I'm not try, even trying to justify myself anymore. I take wrong. Only then could he have cried out for mercy. And then he, the, the question was, did his parents sin? Which tells us there are some things that we suffer because of the wrong that was done in past generations. What we call generational curses. So there may be some of us who are living under a generational curse. It might be a curse of poverty. It might be a curse of sickness. It might be um, divorces that happen within your family and you can't understand why. How come everybody, their marriages are breaking up and it's because of things that were done. If there was a lot of adultery in a past generation, then there will be relationship problems in your generation. So it could be something that was done. If your four parents may have been involved in all kinds of witchcraft, then there are curses that would have come to you, spirits that would have been transferred to your generation. So therefore, there are some things we suffer because of what was done in past generations. The good news is what they did good in the past generations will also bring good to you. So you have generational curses and you have generational blessings. But at the end of the day, it all goes to say this. If we do right, we shall see good. And our children and our generations will be blessed. Psalm 112, it says, The generation of the upright shall be blessed. They shall be great on the face of the earth. So when you do right and you choose to live a life that pleases God, you are laying up a greater inheritance for your children and your grandchildren than money in the bank. Amen. Amen. So there are many reasons why we suffer what we do. In this woman's case, she had listened to many people, but she had never heard about the right one. Until that day, she heard about Jesus. Hope rose up inside of her, and she thought something. Now, when you hear the truth, when you receive the word of God, you need to ponder it in your heart. 
The Bible says, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of the sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law that he meditate day and night. You see, if you fill your, your heart and your mind with truth, with the word of God, if you meditate on the word of God, there is no entrance for the enemy to bring his lies. Everything we suffer, even though we have prayed, it means we have believed a lie of the enemy. When you pray and you still feel you have the pain, don't worry about it. Say, Lord, I have prayed. You said by the stripes of Jesus I am healed. That's a lie of the enemy and it's defeated in Jesus' name. She heard about Jesus and she thought something. What are you thinking about your problem today? What are you thinking about your situation? She thought to herself, you know what? If I could only touch the hem of his garment. She thought the right thing. You need to think the right thing. If I could touch the hem of his garment, I know I shall be made whole. After she thought, she made a decision. Well, I'm not only going to think the right things. You know, we're full of good thoughts, you know. We know the word of God. The word of God is inside of us. But what are we doing about it? You see, faith without works is dead. If you just have the word inside of you and just believe in God, but you're not acting as if you believe it's not going to do anything for you. Jesus said, if you have faith as a grain of mustard seed, then you shall do what? You shall speak. You shall say. Do you know your miracle begins in your mouth? How many of you never knew that? Your miracle is in your mouth. Tell the person next to you, your miracle is in your mouth. A closed mouth is a closed destiny. If you're not saying something, you're not having anything. Death and life are in the power of your tongue. Therefore, you have to be very careful what you say. Be careful what you say because your words become self-fulfilling prophecies. So when you are not well and you keep saying, hmm, I will never get better. Well, be it on to you. That's what happens. Recently, I listened to a testimony of a... Uh, man by the name of John Ramirez. Have you look, listened to it, anybody? He was a Satanist, heavily involved in Satan worship. And he gave his testimony because eventually he got saved. Thank God for that. But he exposed many things. And one of the things he said is they used to laugh at Christians. He said because they would lift their hands and praise the Lord, and the next minute they would be saying all kinds of bad things. He said, and it was what they said that gave these demons entrance to attack. That's why you guard your tongue. That's why you don't tell somebody who you are angry with, why don't you go and die? Or in Trinidad, I say, why are you do dead? <laughs> See, I'm in New York, I'm talking like an American. Why don't you go and die? <laughs> but home, they would say, why are you do dead? And you know what? The next thing you have released entrance for a death spirit to come to that person. When you say things like, it look like I will suffer for the rest of my life. You have re opened the doorway for sufferings to come. Are we learning something this morning? Yes. Your words have power. You want your pastor to be the most powerful man of God that you know God created him to be? Stop saying negative things about him. I'm not saying that you do. I don't know. But I understand. You see, I'm a pastor. So I know sometimes you're doing your best to do the right thing and some people are never happy. And they will say things they ought not to say. What you pray for your pastor, what you invest into him is what you will really receive from him. Amen. Amen. 
bless the servant of God. Bless him with your substance. Bless him with your confessions. Bless him with your prayers. And watch what blessings will come to your life. As you bless him and you declare and decrease and, and declare and decree the in, increase of the anointing upon his life, there's an anointing that will increase upon your life. Amen. Amen. So there's power in what you say. That's why the Bible says, let your conversation be without covetousness. Why? Because God has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you, so that you may boldly confess, the Lord is my helper. I shall not fear. What can man do unto me? So in other words, God has given to us his word. He has given to us his promises that we may declare his word. How many of you know the only real thing in this life is the word of God? The word of God is more real even than the person sitting next to you. The word of God shall never return to him void. It is settled in heaven. The Bible says, though heaven and earth should pass away, yet my word will stand forever. It means that where, because God's word is settled in heaven, there must be something that you, you know, there must be a revelation that you have from God that you must be able to believe and apply to your situation. Because the word of God, when God created the universe, he didn't take things to make it. He had a vision in his heart and he spoke a word. And out of his word came the universe. It has, his word has creative miracle work and power. From the time you declare and decree the word of God over your life, over your situation by faith, whatever is happening around you has no choice but to turn around and submit to what the word of God says. That's why when you wake up in the morning before you complain and before you worry about what's going to happen, you start commanding your day. You start declaring the, the promises of God over your life. Lord, I thank you. This is the day that you have made. I will rejoice. I will be glad in it. Everything that is coming my way must submit to your perfect will for my life that I should be blessed and highly favored. I am blessed in my going out. I'm blessed in my coming in. Whatever I set my hands to do, I shall prosper. The Lord will cause the enemies that rise up against me to be smitten before my face for they will come one way, but they will flee seven ways. Every obstacle, every hindrance that the enemy has placed must be removed. Now, if you make a declaration like that, every morning you wake up, wow, you will surely walk in a realm of miracles. Day after day after day. So she had a revelation that there was someone by the name of Jesus. Do you know who Jesus is? Well, behave like it. Some of us walking around as if Jesus is still on the cross. Amen. Some of us walking around as if he's still in the grave. But let me tell you, we serve a Jesus who on the third day raised himself back up from the dead. And therefore there is no trial or tribulation or famine or peril or nakedness or sword that will separate me from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus. But in all these things I am more than a conqueror. Amen. Amen. Is that the Jesus that you believe in? Death could not hold him. The grave could not keep him. So she heard about Jesus. That's a good person to think about in the midst of your issue. Remembering what he accomplished on the cross for you. He said, behold. Let me tell you, don't take yourself lightly. Tell the person next to you, you don't know who you are. Now we sing the song, I know who I am. Do we sing it in this church? Yes. yes. But it's not just a song. It's something that must be living inside of you. Yes. That determines what you look like. How you react to your situation. Whether you're happy. You know who you are. Working miracles. Walking in favor. Yes. Amen. That's who you are. Don't take yourself lightly. You're not an ordinary person. You are a son. You are a daughter of the Most High God. How many of us in growing up, we might have seen somebody who was very rich or very powerful. 
And you can say, I wish that was my father. I wish that was my mother. Let me tell you, you have greater than any of them as your heavenly father. And if we, the Bible says, if we being evil know how to bless our children, how much more does our heavenly father know to give us what we need? Amen. So she heard about someone, and that's a good person to hear about and to think about in the midst of your situation. So she heard about Jesus, and she, she thought something. She said, you know what? I know. What do you know? I know. If I just touch the hem of his garment. Why did, why did she not say if I could touch him? She knew she was unclean. She was considered unclean. But she said, that's okay. I believe this man, what I've heard about him is so true that all I have to do is touch the hem of his garment. Now that was the prayer shawl or the talith in which there were everything on the talith. You know, there's a, there are symbols that represent the word of God, the blessings of God, the commandments of God. And there's a, a particular thread that runs through the talith that represents the blood of Jesus Christ and his healing power. So she said, I know if I could just touch the hem of his garment, I shall be made whole. And after thinking, she did something. You see, it's not just enough to think. You know, I know if I pray, but you don't pray. I know if I come to church and then you stay home. Pastor Dave, I don't understand it. Why when some people have problems, they decide to stay away from church? That doesn't even make sense. It does not compute. So, you know, I, I'm so fed up on my problem, I'm even feeling to go to. That's a strategy of the enemy. See, you believe in the lies of the enemy. Well, if I have a headache, I'll stay home. No, this is the healing center. Let me tell you something. Do you know the, the anointing that is in this place? The anointing that comes, that shows up when we gather together in the name of Jesus, contains everything that you need. So tell the person next to you, don't ever make that mistake again. It's not even smart. I'm not going to say what it is, but it's not smart to make such a decision. Come into the house of the Lord. Under the corporate anointing, you will find miracles. You will find faith to take your eyes off the bigness of the problem and look to the greatness of the God that you serve. So then she thought, she said, you know, I'm going to touch. So she did the right thing. First she heard the right thing, she thought the right thing, and then she did the right thing. She began to reach out to Jesus. And you know what? She was so weak. I believe she had to get on her hands and knees. And that's a good place to be when you need Jesus, on your knees. Amen. Amen. She was on her knees crawling between the crowd. And I'm sure there were many discouraging voices saying to her, Woman, wh where do you think you're going? Look at the crowd. Somebody's going to trample upon you. And maybe somebody was saying, I know who you are. You are unclean. What are you doing here? You're not supposed to be among anybody. But that didn't stop her. I want to know, have you been listening to discouraging voices? Has God put a vision in your heart and somebody's trying to steal it from you? I remember when I first got saved and God began to open up his word to me and sometimes I would go to church on a Sunday morning and just what the Lord spoke to me, my pastor would preach the exact message and I couldn't understand it. And then I was telling him, he said, well, you know, start writing down what the Holy Spirit says to you. God is giving you messages to preach one day. And I remember one lady who I thought was a very spiritual person. Well, not everybody who says God is godly. We know that. Jesus said in the last days, many will come and say, Lord, Lord, and say, who are you again? I don't recognize you. So anyway, I told her what was happening, and hear what she said. Well, you know, everybody who gets saved wants to preach, but I don't think you call to preach, just like that. She could have shut down my dream. She could have killed my destiny. But you know what? I refuse to listen. Tell the person that you refuse to listen. Put out the voices of discouragement. You need to know when people telling you, God cannot use you. Oh, well, you know, who do you think you are? Say, I know who I am. We have to have a little attitude, you know. 
We don't just say, well, I know who I am. Well, I know who I am. Well, I can't shake up the head and think, but I know who I am. I'm not letting any miserable person come and tell me I'm anything less than a child of God, anointed and appointed, tongue-talking, devil-chasing. Nobody's going to tell me that's not who I am. When Jesus, in that same account, you know, Jesus went to pray for a young child who was dying. When he went to the house, he said, don't trouble the master, the child is already dead. You see, the doctors had given a, a, a statement, a sentence, the child is dead. And Jesus said, no, the child is not dead. You see, he knew something they didn't know. And sometimes your pastor will say something to you and you can't. They say, but where he get that from? That is not what I'm seeing. Take it. He hears from God. We need to understand the gift of the pastor. He is a gift to you and he has a gift inside of him to know what is best for you. And so, he said, the child is only asleep. And they began to laugh and mock him. Yes, oh, you know better than the doctors now. You know, yeah, but, you know, and people, can, well, I know the word of God says this, but you have to use wisdom. The only wisdom I know is believe God with all my heart, even if, it doesn't look like it's going to happen. He said, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not onto your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him. And he will die. I have stopped trying to figure it out. I just like God to show up because when he does, it's always so awesome. And usually, it's not the way I thought it would happen. So remove the voices. The Bible says Jesus put them out. And he just took two of his disciples in with him. And he spoke to that girl, and she rose from the dead. Remove yourself. I remember some years ago, a Muslim family, they had a little son just about six years old. He fell from upstairs to downstairs, hit his head on a concrete pot, went into a coma. The doctors said he would not live. And even if he did, he would be a vegetable because of brain damage. So about a few days later, one of their relatives called me and asked me if I would go and pray. How many of you know as a child of God, we, we are solutions looking for problems. We shouldn't always be having problems looking for solutions. You know, it's a crazy thing. We have all of this power and we're always looking for a solution. No, we are solutions that should be looking for problems. And from the time somebody shows up and says, this is wrong, you, you should get excited. Say, wow, I can't wait to see what God is going to do. So her, the relative asked me if I would go and pray for the child, and I did go. No, they were not Christians. And as I went in, one of the relatives was standing there, and I said, you know, um, how is the child? Is he better? She said, Trini language, eh? It is no better in this now? That child go dead. Well, immediately, righteous indignation rose up inside of me. And I said, Madam, could you excuse me? I'm here to pray. But anyway, long story short, I prayed. I had no doubt in my mind that what Satan meant for evil, God could turn it around. I had no doubt in my mind that what is impossible with men is possible with God. And so I prayed, and I left it in God's hands. By the time I reached home that evening, they called to say the child came out of the coma and was talking. All the glory belongs to God. I am so grateful today that because of knowing Jesus Christ, him crucified and resurrected, I never doubt God's ability. I don't have to worry. I don't have to be in despair about anything. And so she went on her hands and knees, in spite of the discouraging voices, in spite of the obstacles in her way, she reached out, the Bible says. She touched the hem of his garment. And the Bible says, immediately. How many of you need God to do something immediately? Right this moment, you are in the right place because the same Jesus who was in that place, the day that woman was healed, is the same Jesus who is here today. He is in our midst. He is the miracle worker. Amen. Do you believe this morning? Yes. Jesus felt the virtue come out of him. 
You see, when you get on your knees before God and you reach out with all that is inside of you, he will touch you. From the time that prayer and that faith leaves you, something leaves heaven for you. There's a miracle in motion for you this morning. If you would trust him with all of your heart. If you would bring every issue before him. If you would go past every negative thing that anyone and anybody has ever said. If you would refuse to acknowledge the negative reports of the doctors. As children of God. Our life is not determined by what men say, but by what God has said. Amen. Amen. There's a miracle here for you this morning, whatever that issue might be. He turned around and he said, who touched me? And his disciples were saying, well, master, you know, it's a, just a couple of thousand people around you pushing and trying to get hold of you. He said, no, this was a different touch. I tell you, when you reach out to God this morning, as you bring that issue before him, and you say, Lord, men have said there's no way out. My own thinking and reasoning has made me think it is impossible. It's not going to happen. But today I change my thinking because your word says something different. Your word says that though many be the, the, the afflictions of the righteous, the Lord will deliver us out of them all. Yeah. And when she realized that Jesus knew what had happened, she was afraid and then she acknowledged. And she said, daughter, be of good cheer. God is saying to you this morning, be of good cheer. You know, through all the scriptures, you will say, fear not and be of good cheer. Let not your heart be troubled. In other words, all of these, worrying, being dismayed, fretting, are all negative emotions that hinder your miracle. Tell the person next to you, worry and never solve the problem yet. The things that you fear the most are the things that will happen to you. God has not given to us the spirit of fear or of worry or of stress or of depression. The word depressed must not be in our vocabulary. When people come for counseling and say, Pastor, I'm so depressed. I say, well, God didn't give you that. I cast it out in Jesus' name. Where that coming from? What right you have to have fear living inside of you? No. You have to reject these spirits. They are spirits. He said, God has not given to us a spirit of fear. You cast it out. And you choose instead. You see, life is all about choices. It's about decisions. You have the power to choose what you think, how you feel, how you react to situations. Amen. And we have to choose when problems arise to find a solution. We must be proactive and not reactive. Human nature, friend, time something happened, you want to feel, you know, I never see people could feel like Christian people. So much feelings. And they didn't know how I feel. Listen, if you're feeling sad, feel glad. It's a choice. One day, a, a couple came and I was counseling and the man said, I don't feel I love my wife. I said, that's a bad feeling. Love your wife. <laughs> it's a choice. It's all about choices. One girl, you know, they were living at her, her parents' home and, and her parents were interfering in their marriage and everything and the husband decided, well, you know what? I'm going to my mother's house. We're going to live downstairs. So she called me and she was so sad. She said, you know, Pastor, I don't mind going there, but, you know, I don't even have a proper toilet. I said, well, build a toilet. <laughs> Solve your problem. Stop fretting over it. Be proactive. God has not planned any defeats for you. He has, there's a promise for every problem. Activate. Do whatever you can do. 
and let God do the rest. There's a promise that you need to stand upon. Amen. You're not feeling well? Don't give in to sickness. Say, so, well, Lord, Father, you said, by the stripes of Jesus I am healed. I claim my healing. I reject sickness from my body. Now, if sometimes you reject sickness, you find it still stays on. Nothing is wrong with going to the doctor, but you mix that treatment with your prayers and watch what God will do. Even pray over your doctor. Lord, grant him divine wisdom and understanding that whatever he says will come from you because you know everything. No false diagnosis. Amen. There's nothing that God cannot and will not do for you, his beloved child. You are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people. We are in this world, but we are not of this world. There's a power that lies inside of us. There's someone who lives in us that is greater than anything that we face in this world. And if we begin to walk by faith and not by sight, every day that we live, we will experience miracles. And Jesus said, whatever you ask, you will have so that what? Your joy shall be full. How many of you know when the miracle comes, joy comes? How many of you need some joy this morning? Well, you need your miracle, and you are in the right place because the miracle worker is in the house. The word of God has gone forth, and God will confirm his word. How many of you this morning will stop trying to fix what you cannot fix and cast your burdens upon the Lord? He said, cast your burdens upon me because I care for you. He says, it is vain for you to rise up early and sit up late and eat the bread of sorrows. For the Lord gives his beloved rest. There's someone about to receive rest this morning. Your problem has been around for too long. I want you to say to your problem, say no more. I want us to stand. Have you received this word this morning? The eyes of the Lord are upon you. In the book of Jeremiah 29 and verse 11, I know, God is saying, the thoughts that I think towards you. Not thoughts of evil, but thoughts of peace and an expected end. What is that end? His thoughts towards you is, are you are healed, you are blessed. You are protected. You are favored. The solution to your problem is on the way. No weapon formed or fashioned against you will prosper. Hallelujah. Talk to God about everything. Right now, I want you to bow your heads. Close your eyes. And whatever that situation is, bring it before the Lord. Say, Lord, I have carried it for too long. But today I say no more. I cast this burden upon you. I claim my miracle. I claim my healing. I claim my deliverance. I claim restoration for my family. Restoration in my marriage. Everything that you have need of. I want you to look to the God who owns the cattle on the thousand hills, the wealth in every mine, the God whose eyes are upon the righteous, whose ears are open to your cry, who David said, he said, once I was young and now I am old, but I have never seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging bread. If there is something that you have done to that placed you in your situation. Let's pray a prayer of repentance. Say, Lord, I didn't do right. I made a mistake. I made the wrong choice. And today I repent. I have nobody else to blame. I'm not even trying to justify myself. But just as I am, I come to you. Knowing that you have made provision. That if I confess my sin, you are faithful and just to forgive and to cleanse me from all unrighteousness. Thank you for forgiveness. And now, Lord, 
I ask you to intervene supernaturally and turn this situation around. What Satan has meant for evil, I stop it now in Jesus' name. And I claim my miracle by faith in you. I claim my healing and my deliverance. Come on, reach out to him right now. Reach out. There are miracles in motion. There's such an anointing for miracles here right now. Father, as I lift your people before you, I declare war on the devil's war against them. I bring to naught every wicked plot and plan and device of the enemy. Every wicked strategy that has been designed to bring hurt, to steal, to kill, to destroy, to break up homes and marriages, to steal their blessings. I destroy those wicked plans now. I bring them to naught. I confuse the plans of the enemy. I declare today that whatever confusion the enemy has sent will become his own confusion right now. Lord, I declare war on the enemies that have risen up. I say no weapon formed or fashioned against God's people will prosper. Every tongue that has risen up in judgment is now condemned. I bind up wicked and evil and lying confessions and accusations in Jesus' name. Every demonic assignment to break up homes and families, those assignments are canceled now. I say go back to your Sunday in the name of Jesus. And I speak reconciliation and restoration. Lord, those who are struggling financially, I command curses be broken. Curses be broken. Lord, if they have found themselves in a bad place because they have withheld what belonged to you, if they have not been faithful in their tithe and their offerings, I pray, God, that, Lord, you give them that revelation, that as they repent, Father God, that the windows of heaven will open and that you will rebuke the devourer in the name of Jesus, that uncommon favor will come upon your people. Lord, you said you will open to them your good treasure. You will bless their bread basket and their storehouses. You will bless them in the fruit of their bodies and whatever they set their hands to do, they shall prosper. I decree and declare that wealth and riches will come into their hands in Jesus' name. Those who are sick in body, I take authority over sickness and infirmity. I break the curse of sickness and death now in Jesus' name. And I release healing and deliverance, miracle working power, resurrection power and life flow through their bodies from the crown of their heads to the soles of their feet. I send your word and I command their bodies to respond and submit to your word that says by the stripes of Jesus, they are healed and set free now. Father, we give you praise. Thank you, Lord, for the release of your anointing to break and destroy every yoke, every bondage, every oppression. Lord, those who are bound by habits, I command every yoke, every bondage be broken right now in the name of Jesus. And Father, we give you praise. We thank you for miracles. We thank you for miracles now in Jesus' holy name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Do you receive it this morning? Amen. Hallelujah. Can you give him a shout of praise? Can you say thank you, Jesus? Hallelujah. Come on, make a prophetic declaration over your life. Today is the beginning of your best life ever. Declare that the favor of God is upon your life. Declare that your circumstances are about to change. Amen. Hallelujah. 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 I'm going to hand over to the pastor now. I know there might be some of you who came with a need for prayer. And you want to come forward right now. So that we can agree with you. For your miracle. For God to intervene. I want you to leave right where you are. And walk right up to the front. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Savior, I come. The woman Quiet heard the word and she did something. Hallelujah. Redemption still. Your blood was spilled. Oh, my ransom, everything I wanted, I count it all as all. To me to the cross, where your love for life. Bring me 
much money. Bring me a 